we've seen recently on the streets of Bendigo. Efforts to water down racial vilification laws and anti-terror laws that reach ever more deeply into our daily lives. But while this situation sounds gloomy, we're fortunate that there are people who spend their lives trying to bring justice to bear on these issues. And tonight, we'll hear from two people who've done much more than most in this sphere. First of all, Gillian Triggs is a distinguished international lawyer and the former president of the Australian Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission. She has combined work in commercial legal practice with an academic career and has held positions including Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Sydney and Director of the British Institute of International and Comparative Law. She is the new chair of Justice Connect, a non-profit organisation that connects people locked out of the justice system with free legal help and continues to be a champion for social justice. Only a fortnight ago, she was in Canberra to call for an Australian Bill of Rights in an address hosted by Amnesty International Australia and the ANU College of Law. Julian Burnside is a barrister based here in Melbourne. He's well known as one of the nation's most passionate and eloquent advocates for asylum seekers, and he has worked pro bono on countless asylum seeker cases. He's a former president of Liberty Victoria and has received numerous awards in recognition of his advocacy for asylum seekers, including the Sydney Peace Prize, which he was awarded in 2014. He's also been made an officer of the Order of Australia and in 2004 was elected as a, national, a living national treasure. And we are delighted that he's joined us tonight to talk about an issue which he knows so well. Now the format for this evening is that Gillian and Julian will talk for about 60 minutes and then we'll have time for some Q&A for about half an hour with your audience and we're aiming to finish at about 8 o'clock. So for now I will leave you in their very capable hands to discuss how human rights can be extended and defended. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gillian Triggs and Julian Burnside. Thank you. It's always lovely to sit down and chat to you. And I was wondering what we should start with tonight. We started actually on chamber music, but that's probably <laughs> not what people are here to listen to. But John just gave me the uh, idea. Think about Indigenous rights. It's difficult to go to any public event in this country without hearing someone say that we acknowledge that traditional owners of the land we meet on, their elders past, present and emerging. Why don't we also acknowledge that our forebears took the land from them and we're not giving it back? Why do we not acknowledge yeah. it? <laughs> um, because I think that Australians have a lot of trouble recognising this um, and saying it. Um, we've, uh, there has to be some explanation for why the government has rejected so ignominiously the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, I find it quite extraordinary that this uh, considered proposal that was developed over many, many months in consultation should have been dismissed in the way that it has been with, I think, a joint parliamentary committee now to look at it. Um, I think that that failure of leadership does filter through society mm. as a whole. Uh, I think we have a lot of trouble as Australians recognising what we did when we came to Australia. Mm. I'm a £10 pummy migrant. I'm <laughs> many years after the original act, but nonetheless, um, I'm very conscious of it. And um, well, I think we John, can't do it. John with Howard's it. explanation for it back then was that wasn't us. That wasn't our generation. And yet, and yet, he hoisted Anzac Day celebrations to a new level. Mm. And that wasn't us either. That was our great-grandparents, if anyone. That's right. Mm. Yes, he, 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 they're clever, slick arguments mm. that really don't have any substance. But, but uh, we'll probably come back to this, uh, but a, a recurring theme for me is the, the failure of leadership on these issues. And I think when you don't have leadership, then that tends to license people throughout the community to, to take the same view. And I think too many of us have, have allowed that thinking to, to become pervasive, partly driven, I think, by a fear that we're going to have to compensate or that we'll lose something. Mm. And, and I think that's, so much modern politics is driven by, by fear in one way or another. Mm. 
you know, the fear that we might lose our land, but we've made it very clear we're not giving it back. I, I actually had an idea a little while ago that I think Aborigines are now about 2.8% of the population. I had an idea that all the land that we took from them, which we're not giving back, you could put a once-off capital tax of 2.8% on it and hypothecate that money specifically for Aboriginal communities. Of course, not surprisingly, Jared Henderson got stuck into me saying what a ludicrous idea it was and how I wasn't going to give back my home and all that sort of thing. But I think it might work. Well, it, it, I don't really think it's about the money. There are quite significant sums of money put into indigenous programs of one kind or mm. another and, and um, native title has moved of course with a snail's pace but we now have uh, the states uh, engaging in, in treaty relations with indigenous peoples again not led at the federal level but coming from, from the states, uh, state governments uh, particularly uh, in the Victoria and Western Australia it's not really been about the money it's really been the core difficulty, I think, and, and this is reflected all the time in my discussions throughout Australia with Indigenous peoples, is the failure to consult with them. So that when you impose a policy, uh, whatever it is and how, how, whether it's in good faith, and it usually is in good faith, it will not work if you haven't engaged the local community. And that's particularly the drug and alcohol areas, the, the, ba the, the basics welfare card. Uh, they work in communities that have been engaged in the process of agreeing on the proposals, but they don't work uh, where, they, where there's not been consultation. And I think that's the, if we could consult in a way that re re respected that slightly less than 3% uh, indigenous population, I think we'd move a lot further forward. Yeah, and yet, consulting may involve acknowledging that there are other positions which we don't like to acknowledge. No, well, but that, that is a logical conclusion of consulting with somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so it, 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 it creates a problem for government and the government is deeply fearful of the need for, for mm. some massive form of compensation or loss of what we've gained. To what extent do you think our approach to the indigenous population he reflects the attitudes of society at large, and to what extent does it just reflect the attitudes of people in government? Well, I, I guess it's not one or the other necessarily, but I'm, I'm inclined after particularly my last um, five years uh, with, with the Human Rights Commission to say that so much of this is led by government. Um, most Australians never deal with indigenous com peoples at all. Mm. Um, they have very little contact with them. And, and I'd have to say to my shame that um, uh, when, I, when I took over the role as president of the Australian Human Rights Commission, I had never worked directly with an indigenous lawyer. Um, I'd had indigenous students as in the law school at Sydney when I was dean, but I had never worked professionally on an equal basis with an indigenous lawyer. Um, and I knew very little about, about, apart from the legal aspects concerning indigenous issues, I knew very little about how their communities work, what their problems were, or and what I didn't understand, but I now have a better sense of, is the, the wisdom and spirituality that they bring. The richness that we lose by ignoring them as part mm. of our own culture is, is breathtaking. Mm. Um, but it has to be learned. And I think because most of us don't ever connect with indigenous peoples, uh, certainly not in the rural and remote areas, I think we've got very little empathetic sense of what their problems are. Mm. It's funny, I've sometimes thought that the only bright spot in this area comes from Tony Abbott, who, of course, is a, a, a f fearless um, campaigner against the idea of climate change. If he turns out to be wrong, as I think he will, um, we're all history. There'll be a few survivors, the Kalahari Bushmen, Outback Aborigines, so it may be that Tony Abbott leads to the Aborigines getting their land back. <laughs> well, I hope it's not apocalyptic <laughs> in that way. <laughs> but, I, but you do remind me um, of, uh, and I forget that it was about five years ago, I happened to be in, in, in Parliament House when that remarkable piece of legislation was passed, <coughs> Julia Gillard as Prime Minister and, and Tony Abbott as Leader of the Opposition, when they passed the legislation that set in process 
the consultation that led to the Uluru uh, Statement for, uh, from the Heart. And that was a remarkable day. I mean, uh, politicians from all sides of politics were, were roaming the marble corridors up there in Canberra, congratulating themselves on this remarkable um, mm. legislation <laughs> uh, and, and a tragedy that it should fall apart in the way that it has. Mm. But it was, that, was, that was an optimistic moment on the, uh, in the past that mm. perhaps I think we should strive to get back to. Of course, it would be difficult for you to be optimistic about the political process, given what happened to you as chair of the Human Rights Commission. Um, when you, this was start of 2012, I think, wasn't it? That's right. You were um, reporting on what was going on in Nauru and the terrible damage being done to children there. And then they brought up John Bassick Bassick. That's right. Yes. Remind people of John Bassick Bassick's case. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, I was completely surprised by this because uh, it, it seemed so obvious to me, but the Basic Basic case was, a, was a, a man from Papua who had come to Australia as a political refugee and he was acknowledged to be a refugee. He'd, um, in those days, Australia was acknowledging that there was a right to claim asylum and he was duly recognised as a refugee in, in all the circumstances. Um, however, he had uh, some cognitive intellectual disabilities, he was a violent man, he had a partner, he became very violent and he killed her, uh, particularly nastily, with a, um, w with a wheel of a bicycle. It was a nasty killing. Uh, he was charged with manslaughter and convicted and he served uh, the full period of his um, prison sentence of eight years uh, without parole being permitted. He got to the end of the eight years and uh, he was immediately re-arrested because he couldn't be held in a maximum security prison anymore. He was held, uh, arrested again and held again in a maximum security facility for by now an al another 11 years. And this is because his visa had been cancelled on character grounds? Uh, well, they didn't, that wasn't the term at the time, yeah, but that, yeah. that's pretty much what they did. Mm. They simply said uh, uh, we couldn't send, they couldn't send him back, they acknowledged they couldn't send him back to Papua, uh, and the minister and respective ministers across governments have said they would not release him because he was dangerous. Now, the, 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 the key point goes back to the Magna Carta. In the middle of this uh, extraordinary document of 1215 is a provision that no man may be detained arbitrarily without charge or trial by his peers. This is not a left-wing um, imagination of, of the General Assembly since 1945. This is a core principle. Oh, I thought of... King John was a rabid left-wing. <laughs> um, yeah, his feudal barons, I think, were <laughs> full in that role. But, but the key point is that this principle that no person may be detained without charge or trial by their peers is fundamental to at least our common law system and, in fact, common to just about any other major legal system. We, however, because of the concept of executive power, which worries me greatly in Australia, the expansion of executive power, the government and ministers decided that they would hold him in a maximum security prison indefinitely, and he's been there indefinitely. It would now be about, uh, about 13 years. Now, my point is, uh, he came to the commission with a complaint. Uh, I reviewed the complaint as president, and I'm, I was, that was my job, and I found that to detain him without charge or trial, and to detain him in a maximum security prison without the medical care and support that he needed was or constituted arbitrary detention um, and that he should therefore be removed from maximum detention, put into hospital detention of some kind, but certainly given the treatment that he needed uh, or uh, given another charge and tried before a, a judge and jury and, and prosecuted in the normal way. Well, I reported, as I reported probably 20 times a year on cases, egregious cases of this kind, including the detention, of course, of children on Nauru and, uh, and Manus at that time and other parts of Australia. But like so many of those reports, they must be tabled in Parliament by the Attorney General. But the Attorney General will table the reports with the words, I table this report. So there was no name, no context, nothing that would tell the public or parliamentarians what these reports were about. And many of them, if not most of them, sank like a stone. So it was with complete surprise that, uh, that at one of the many Senate estimates that I attended over the five years, uh, the, uh, some of the senators chose to pick up the Basic Basic case. And they said that I was, in effect, wanting to release dangerous um, 
violent men who killed their partners in the most violent of ways, I wanted to release them on, onto the streets and that I should be ashamed of myself and I'd got it wrong and I, was, um, I should resign. Hmm. Uh, so this went on over several Senate estimates, uh, simply attacking um, on, on a ground that they felt they could get public sympathy for, hmm. um, where they really ignored the core point that I was trying to make, yep. that there is a right to some proper judicial process that limits executive discretion to detain. Yeah. And that's what made me think um, again recently of A against the Secretary of State, a decision of the House of Lords in London. Um, the English Parliament had passed legislation which said that if a person was a refugee, so they can't be removed from the country, and a suspected terrorist, although they haven't been charged or committed, uh, convicted, that person could be uh, put in detention for up to 12 months. And that was said to be to preserve the life of the nation, which is a sort of get-out clause in the Human Rights Act, because this was absolutely incompatible with the English Human Rights Act. Um, but it would have been okay if it was to preserve the life of the nation. So the question ends up in the House of Lords, is this valid legislation or not? Eight to one, they said, no, it's not. And Lord Hoffman finished his speech saying, that the life of the nation is less threatened by terrorism than by laws like these. Very powerful idea. Mm, it was. I was really impressed when I read that. If only, if only we could get someone in this country saying that. Well, that's, right. that's true, and that, that comes back to the point mm. about leadership. In that case, of course, a very mm. highly regarded judge of the, of the then House of Lords. Mm. But the point also needs to be made that Lord Hoffman had a Human Rights Act. Uh, yeah. There was a, he had a power yeah. to say, to detain indefinitely at the whim of the executive is contrary to the Human yeah. Rights Act. And that's why preserving the life of the nation was an important get out. Because that's right. if they could establish that, then they could legislate mm -hmm. in a way that was incompatible. But the key point of difference is that we don't have hmm. a Charter or Bill of Rights or Human Rights Act in yeah. Australia. Uh, I mean, in, in talking about this in Victoria doesn't have quite the same impact as it might in other parts of Australia because, of course, you're the only state that, that has a, 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 a human rights uh, um, a charter. So you're, the thinking of Victorians is much more likely to be informed by that fundamental charter. Uh, but, of course, at the federal level, we don't have that, uh, unlike, of course, the United Kingdom. Mm. Of course, the, um, the Victorian Human Rights Act is a very weak model and has generated very little litigation and no significant legal fees for any lawyers. So <laughs> the idea of a lawyer's feast is false. The idea of a sudden tidal wave of litigation is false. Um, I don't know what the politicians are scared about. Well, as all the, of course, the argument that many politicians make, uh, particularly um, uh, Bob Carr from New South Wales, has done pro more to damage the the prospects of a, of a Bill of Rights or Charter of Rights in Australia than anybody, I think. Mm. And the argument he makes over and over again is not only lawyers making money, which is clearly false, but that judges will suddenly go from being conservative, trained, educated lawyers to left-wing activists uh, inventing the law as they go along. And the, it is interesting that in Victoria, with the Charter of Rights, only 1.6% of cases uh, by the Supreme Court uh, has ever even mentioned the, char the, the Charter of Human Rights. Mm. It just has not been a vehicle for rampant uh, judicial creativity that is being alleged by many of our politicians. But, but at the same time, I wouldn't want anybody to think that it's therefore ineffective. It is weak, you're right, Julian, but mm. it's, it's a, a great deal better than anything else we've got. Mm. Um, and I think it's probably a model that we could learn, at least as a foundation stone, to move to the next stage. But the key point, and that the reason it's so important in Victoria, is that, um, of course, it informs the decisions of decision makers, of government officials. Mm. And, and that is where you have the impact of a Bill of Rights uh, seeping through the administrative daily lives of citizens in a much more effective way than if it wasn't there. Mm. And a, a very recent example, in fact, I think only a couple of months ago, the uh, Victorian Supreme Court uh, ruled on the basis of the Charter in Victoria that juveniles should not be held in adult prison facilities. And you might recall they've been moved now from the Barwon Heads facility yeah. back up to, up to Parkville. Difficult circumstances, I do understand that. But nonetheless, the reason that was able to... Um, be clearly stated by the Victorian Supreme Court was that you have a charter here and at the Human Rights Commission we tried to um, bring juveniles in 
adult facilities in Western Australia into proper juvenile facilities, mm. but failed, and one very good reason was there was no charter. Mm. Just going back to the um, Basic Basic case and the attack that that I provoked. thought we might have got away for that one. Yeah. After. <laughs> I thought it was interesting. Um, for the whole of that attack, a great deal of which concentrated on what you'd said about the cruel consequences of uh, locking kids up on Nauru, um, the report which you had, which you delivered and which had been tabled uh, by statutory obligation, spoke about how bad things were in Nauru, and the government didn't like that, so they, they had to counterattack. And all the while, I discovered a little while later, they delivered, they tabled the report by Philip Moss, That's right. which agreed wholly with what you had mm -hmm. said, but they didn't have to table it. They had it in their back pocket for the whole time of the attacks mm -hmm. on you. That's right. It was astounding. They were prepared to mislead the whole mm -hmm. country in order to make a point against you. That's right. I, I think that was, I was also really unprepared for that because, um, you know, I'd been a relatively conservative lawyer, very only occasionally in the media and an area of expertise, but otherwise not. Um, and I, I thought, somewhat naively, I think, thought that if we did our homework on the facts, worked with a medical profession on the condition of the children, we knew the law, it was not difficult law, they, was det they were detaining children and their families for unprecedented periods of time. Um, surely uh, the conclusions of the report that the conditions were cruel and dangerous, inhumane and contrary to international law and contrary to the treaties that Australia has accepted and, and of course contrary to the underpinning definition mm. of human rights in the Charter, I thought that that will be treated with respect and if there was anything um, wrong with that report, if we got our facts wrong or we got the law wrong or we made an immeasured uh, judgment, um, uh, an immodest judgment, or in some way we uh, targeted one party rather than another, they might have been able to properly criticise. But that's not what they did. They didn't do that. They criticised me personally. And that I really was not prepared for. I couldn't see why they would bother with me mm. when the facts were in front of them. Mm. And, that, and that's a lesson I learned. they never challenged the facts. And they never challenged the facts. They never challenged the facts. And of course, one <clears throat> reason they couldn't challenge the facts was that so many of the medical facts of the impact of the deten prolonged detention on the children were in fact departmental official figures from, mm. the inst from the health and medical services that were provided. Mm. So although we had our own material, they were mirrored exactly. The 34% mental illness of children, for example, at the, at the moderate or senior level was a departmental mm. figure. So I guess they must have said, well, we can't attack this report, yes. but we don't like it, yeah. uh, so we'll attack Gillian. Yeah. Um, and uh, un unfortunately, th th there was a measure of success in that, 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 that uh, picked up, of course, by the, by the, uh, the Murdoch press. Uh, the other press largely left it alone. Um, I now have um, f at least 40 uh, mainly funny but sometimes quite cruel cartoons to explain to my grandchildren. I'm <laughs> collecting them all. Um, but the barrage was, was really, uh, I think, almost unprecedented. It was extraordinary. Yeah. Must have been very hard to hold firm. It was hard to hold firm, and, and I've thought a lot about it, and in a way it's, it's a, a feminist issue, if you don't mind, Julian. Um, I think if it, had been a, <laughs> if it had been a man there in Senate Estimates, challenged for eight hours w with no breakfast, no lunch, um, a man could have been irritable, a bit rude, a little bit discourteous, pushed back, even got a little angry and got away with it. But I knew instinctively that if I lost my temper, if I was as rude to them as they were to me, um, if I were um, immoderate in my response, if I moved away from what I knew about, which was the law and the facts, I would lose my case instantly. I would be seen as an emotional woman who was basically not an pro appropriate appointment. And you know, it did occur to me that maybe I could either faint or burst into tears, <laughs> but I decided that I was too old for all of that, <laughs> and the best thing to do was to, to carry on regardless. But it, it was hard. It was very hard. And, um, but I, if I can tell a, a, sh a short story about these things, always affect your family. And um, I have a wonderful family with a great sense of humour, and a, a husband is always ready with a gin and tonic. But um, uh, on, uh, on one occasion, my son... Uh, rang me up for he, he's a lawyer in Paris. He rang me up and he said, "What have you said this time, Mum?" 
And I said, well, nothing out of the ordinary. And he said, well, you should check the Twitter feed. You're, you're outranking um, Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> and just to annoy my son, I said, who's Taylor Swift? <laughs> I was going to ask you the same question. <laughs> But I, I had this vision, of, I have this vision in my mind of, of sort of satin-clad Taylor Swift waking up in the morning thinking, who is this extraordinary woman and I wonder what song she sings. <laughs> uh, but, um, but there were funny sides, but I'd have to say it was not funny at the time. And uh, I think uh, you'd, I'd pick up the Australian at the weekend and there will be a front page of me, then an editorial, then a cartoon, and probably one of the editorial stable putting in there mm. to... Bobsworth and I mean in the end it became more amusing than serious because it was so over the top and so irrational and 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 blinkered to what I was trying to talk about which was the condition and at that stage of 1100 children in appalling conditions mm. on Christmas Island and Nauru Villawood and uh, and of course at Mitre here in uh, here in Melbourne and they were they were heartbreaking um, circumstances and um, Julian you know this at least as well as I do when you listen to the story of one family one child uh, you can you can't turn your back on them you mm. can't say well I'll add you to my social science research and report to Parliament and we'll see what happens you can't do that and I don't think any one of you in the audience could do that either um, they are with us in Australia and we owe protection, but they're human beings. And that comes through loud and clear when you're standing in the heat and the sun, covered in phosphate dust on Christmas Island, talking to these people. You know you're dealing with people who are exactly the same as you. And I deeply believe that the rule of law means that we must treat them with humanity mm. and the rule of law should have its day. Mm. They should have their day mm. with the law. Well, it's interesting you say that about the... <clears throat> okay. the um, obviously, the impact on children is dreadful. In fact, as I understand the science, um, self-harm and suicide is almost unheard of in prepubescent children, mm. except in Australia's detention system. That's right. That's and now, interestingly, the courts seem to be pushing back because there have been a few cases in recent months where children on Nauru, not held in detention, but hiding in the pro regional processing centre because it's too dangerous for them in the community at large, have been self-harming. Several have made really serious attempts to kill themselves. And when we've brought applications in the federal court to have them brought to Australia where they can be properly treated, Dutton sends lawyers along to oppose that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in one case that happened just before Christmas, um, counsel for the minister said, oh, you shouldn't make an order bringing the child here until there's been a trial of the action. And the judge looked at him and said, well, the problem is she might be dead by then. It's a pretty chilling thought. But that's, you know, that's the courts doing the job which that's the parliamentarians nice. should be doing. But I was going to say, the, it's not just children, it's, it's adults as well. I had a very distressing conversation with a... Um, a doctor who worked with IHMS, who provide the medical services under contract to the government, and she'd been a doctor on Christmas Island. Um, and she made the point that when people arrive on the boats, they've typically been in a very difficult voyage. They've typically come from countries that are landlocked, so they haven't been on the ocean before. They've typically spent seven or eight days at sea. They've typically had not enough to eat or drink. They've typically had no opportunity to clean up or change their clothes and they typically arrive in clothing caked with their own excrement. And she said that they're not allowed to clean up or change before they're interviewed by a member of the immigration department. And then if they've got any medication it's taken from them and destroyed. If they've got any medical documentation it's taken from them and destroyed. If they've got any medical prosthetics, false arms for example, those are taken and not returned. Anyway, she told me that there was one woman had been held in detention on Christmas Island for some weeks. You know, the idea of this initial interview is to see whether there's any reason why they can't be shunted off to offshore processing. And she said there was a woman who'd been there for some weeks because she was thought to be mad, but no one knew the nature of her madness. They didn't know why she was mad, because, um, of course, she didn't have any medication or documents or anything like that. 
So the doctor had a very long consultation with this woman, uh, made more difficult by the fact that the interpreter, who they needed, was in Sydney, at the other end of a phone, 4,000 miles away, and the doctor eventually worked out that the problem was the woman was incontinent of urine and she couldn't leave her cabin without having urine running down her leg and that was driving her mad. Um, so the doctor said to immigration, we need incontinence pads. Their initial response is, we don't do those. Um, she insisted and they said, okay, well, she can have four per day. Any more would be a fire hazard, apparently. Uh, but as soon as the woman had incontinence pads, her demeanor changed dramatically. Now, you've got to wonder what sort of people is it that run a system that does that to individual human beings who've done absolutely nothing illegal, although we call them illegals. Mm. What, what sort of system is it? What sort of people can do that? Well, I don't, I don't really understand mm. that. And, and it's, you know, your story is an important one because although one can talk about the, the, the bigger legal principles, um, and even about um, about the law, the Refugee Convention and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Rome Migration Act. Uh, it's the spitefulness of it that, that when you're actually there, uh, it's it's the little things that that mm. that upset people actually. It's in ordinary some ways, decent, it, decent conduct. That's right. Is what you need. I, I, there was one woman that I went to with um with uh, with um on Christmas Island into the living quarters uh, to visit. And um, she had spent three days under a blanket. She was retiring. She was cutting off, wasn't no eye contact with the children. Her husband was frantic, holding the children. I went into the cabin and talked to her. It was swelteringly hot. It was one of these converted shipping containers. The husband was outside with the children crying. She was not communicating. And um, I'd taken a medical officer with me. She went out to help with the children. I stayed with this woman. And she, um, she had a guard at the open door, a woman on guard reading a book. And the, the, uh, the detainee, the woman, started to vomit. And um, I was trying to clean her up and look after her. And I said to the guard, would you get a doctor to come? Because she's, <coughs> she's vomiting and, and she can't stop vomiting and we need some towels and things and, to look after her. And she said to me, that's not part of my job and went back to her novel. And I, I thought... <laughs> Uh, the, the spitefulness, mm. the, one of the things that um, I don't know how many in the audience have ever heard of or know where Yonga Hill is. Does anyone know where it is? Well, Yonga Hill is, yes, one or two people do. You might be West Australians. It's two hours outside Perth. Um, and uh, there are about 350 men there in a maximum security prison. Uh, they are mostly uh, asylum seekers or refugees or they lost their visas on character grounds at the discretion of the minister. And uh, there, there's a lot to complain about, and I won't go through all of that, but the thing that they mostly wanted to talk to me about was they couldn't understand how they were ranked as, risk, uh, as high risk, medium risk, or low risk. And it makes a huge difference to which part of the compound they're in or whether they can do, whether they get books or whether they get the various other forms of reasonable treatment. And I spoke to the superintendent of Yonga Hill and said, well, how do you determine these different security rankings because it affects their lives so intimately and they've been here for years and they're likely to be here for many more years. And he said, oh, well, there's an algorithm. <coughs> and I said, <laughs> Who, how is the algorithm determined? And he said, oh, well, Canberra just puts the statistics in and we get an answer and, if, and that's how we do it. Mm. And uh, there's no personal assessment. Um, and it, it rules the lives of these people in a remote part of Australia that most Australians have never heard of and have no idea where it is. And all this is happening in our name mm. for people who are absolutely in despair with no hope. And typically, um, they are separated from their families. Their families might be in uh, Brisbane or in Sydney, but they're over there in Yonga Hill, so the families can't afford to go and see them. So to come back to the point, it's the, it's the spitefulness <coughs> Of, of many of the policies, as well as the, the enormity of what we're doing. And to go back to your point about the children, um, we found in our study at the Human Rights Commission that the greatest, in fact, something like 90% of the assaults and sexual assaults took place against the children. Mm. And when this figure emerged from our processes, I asked the staff to go back and redo it because I couldn't believe that the ones who were actually most likely to suffer from assault reported reported assaults and sexual assaults were children. I thought we must have got that wrong. And the staff went back 
and clarified the statistic. And again, the government has never refuted it. Mm. So, and a lot of those assaults, as I recall it, are assaults by locals who've been taken onto the payroll, you know, like the locals mm. who look after the showers and offer children an extra one minute under the shower if they expose themselves and so on. That's right. So I, I think that there's, there's, the, there's the big picture. There's trying to understand treatment of people for the, the glib slogans that um, Mr Abbott is largely responsible for and that have been cynical and opportunistic but enormously effective. We've got to, we've got to hold people and treat people in this way. We've got to have offshore processing introduced, of course, by a Labour government in 92, but we've got to do it to stop the boats and save the drownings at sea. And very reasonable people stop me in the supermarket and say, you know, Gillian, we're sympathetic with what you're trying to do, we're sympathetic with these families and their children, but we've got to stop the boats, we've got to stop the people smugglers. Mm. So the political debate has been a very simplistic one and very, very hard to break through those slogans, to say, this is a false binary, that's not a very... <laughs> snappy phrase. Um, I've, got to, I've got to learn <laughs> how to do this. But you've got to be able to say we can secure our borders. Uh, we can rescue people at sea. Hmm. We can work with Indonesia and Malaysia and Vietnam and Sri Lanka and the Philippines. We can work with them to provide protection for people, often stateless, Rohingya and others. Uh, and at the same time, we can assess proper claims to refugee status. We can treat those who are within our borders in a humane way consistent with the law. We can do it. But to make that argument is very, very difficult in a five-second um, uh, uh, grab on but the it's, news. But it's harder than that because you've got to make the argument to people who are willing to listen to it and getting through to the people who don't already share your views is very difficult. You know? Yes, because when do you ever get to talk to mm. them? Because, well, how do, you, how do you get them to hear it at all? They're not going to be listening to, well, Neil Mitchell and uh, people like that probably aren't going to invite you on to give your I've never been things. invited on. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Alan Jones likewise. Mm. And actually, there's one exception to that. I, um, I was given a free run by John Laws when he was um, still on air. I had cross-examined him at the uh, broadcasting cash for comment inquiry and to my surprise, he got very anxious about the fact that uh, Aladdin Sisalem, who was left by himself on Manus after everyone from Manus had been hosed over to Nauru, he was very worried that Aladdin Sisalem uh, had been brought to Australia by court order, but Aladdin had had a cat. The cat was his only company, and the cat had been left on, Nauru, on Manus when Aladdin mm. was brought over to Australia. And John Laws was very worried about the cat. And so his, his um, assistant rang me up and said, look, Mr Laws wants you to come on the program to talk about Aladdin's cat. And I said, look, that's OK as long as he gives me equal time on the refugee situation generally. And to my astonishment, she rang back and said, yes, that'll be OK. And so he gave me about 12 or 13 minutes talking about the cat. And then with seamless skill said, well now, since I've got you on the phone, what are we doing about asylum seekers generally? And he gave me 12 or 13 minutes free air. It's fantastic. Probably yeah. the only time that message has got through to the people who listen to John Laws. Uh, didn't make a difference. Well, that, that is the... That <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you must have made some difference. But, the, but that, is the, that is perhaps a, a very contemporary problem, isn't it? That, that because we can control the media we are exposed to, we live in, in a hall of mirrors. We, we simply, through social media and through the things that we decide we want to be part of, we can control and, uh, and ensure that we have reflected back to us our own views. And that's made it even more difficult to put a view that's, that's different um, in the groups that don't agree with you. Um, and, and that's why I think it's so marvellous to have public um, discussions like this. Mm. Except um, that people, the, I, I'm assuming that most of the people here already agree with us. Well, that's You may very be picking likely. up a fact or two, but you yeah. probably agree with, if there's anyone out there who's on the Alan Jones side of the debate, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's, that's, that's the problem. And, and we now live in this world of post-truth and alternative facts. Mm. It's increasingly difficult to, to try to put a factual evidence-based position 
when there's a growing tolerance for for falsity or for the alternative fact, as mm. the Americans like to call it. Um, so it, it, it has become much more, much more difficult to get the point. And so you've, you find that you, you, do the, you do an op-ed or you do a public speech, but you're, not, you're still not getting to the people that you need to persuade, if you can, yeah. with evidence. Yeah. Well, I mean, have you ever been invited to do an op-ed for the Herald Sun? <laughs> I don't believe I have. No, no nor have I. Um, or they wouldn't publish it if I did one, I'm sure. The... the um, it is a fairly serious difficulty, I think. But of course, all of this, um, a few minutes ago, you said that offshore processing started in 92, brought in by Labor. You meant indefinite detention. I meant indefinite detention, sorry. Offshore yeah. processing, of course, was introduced in 2001 during the Tampa litigation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John Howard ran around and recruited Nauru and Papua New Guinea to uh, take 434 asylum seekers. Can you believe it? And. Um, and that, that ultimately failed, but it is an interesting thing that the public at large, because that coincided, the Tampa litigation coincided rather unhappily with another event, because the judgment of Justice North in the Tampa case was handed down at 2.15 in the afternoon, Melbourne time, on the 11th of September 2001. Eight or nine hours later, the attack on America happened, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Islamophobia became the new anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to be a very, very powerful influence. Mm -hmm. Islamophobic ideas seem to be very powerful now. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there's something called the um, Islamophobia Register that was established about three years ago. And that is now doing what I think the Jewish community have been doing for a very long time. And that is keeping an accurate record of all reported incidents. There are many more incidents than those reported, but it still gives you a bit of an, a sense of what's happening. And I think the, the, um, uh, the Jewish um, Council of Deputies has recently reported a 20% increase in anti-Semitic um, incidents over the last couple of years. Mm. And similarly, the Islamic um, Islamophobia register is also registering, I think, something like 256 um, registered uh, incidents over the last year, and that is rising. Um, and one of the curious features about Islamophobia, of course, is that it's the women who are largely the ones under attack. Mm. It's, the, it's the burqa mm. or, the, or the headscarf, the simple headscarf, um, that is now like a lightning rod for, for public abuse, mm. and those ones do tend to be reported. But I think you're right, Julian, I think it's always hard to put a sort of an historical line in the sand, but I think 2001 was a pivotal year mm. when uh, you might also remember, I think you've pointed out this before, that it was the same year in which uh, Mr. Howard talked, or, or, uh, talked up the lie uh, that uh, asylum seekers had thrown their children overboard. Yes. And that was demonstrated again by a Senate inquiry, a bit like the Moss report, a Senate inquiry that demonstrated there was absolutely no substance to the allegation whatsoever. But what it did from that time on, I think, we've seen a linkage between um, unauthorised maritime arrivals, asylum seekers arriving in boats, boats dashing up against rocks, deaths, deaths at sea, uh, linkage with those of the Islamic faith, and then Mm. an almost immediate linkage with terrorism, 9-11, border security and mm. fear. And, and that year has been pivotal. And when we're seeing the, the, the consequences of that now with mm. uh, the Islamic community really very, very worried indeed. They're a tiny percentage, I think it's 2.2% mm. um, of, of religious groups in Australia. It's very small. Uh, but it's and it's worth mentioning blown that, up. That, that no person who's arrived in Australia as a boat person has ever been convicted of anything in the range of terrorism offences and they are all underrepresented in general crime yeah, statistics. Right. I mean, it's astounding. They are treated as though they're the worst thing ever. Yes, I, th I think it's extraordinary. <coughs> I, I did see a statistic, and I won't quote it because I'm not actually sure that it's true, but I think, or to totally true, but a very, there's a very high... Um, you, you are something like 40 times less likely to be convicted of a criminal offence as an asylum seeker. Mm. It's, quite, it's quite an extraordinary figure. Even if it's half that, it's, it's astonishing. Yeah. Um, but, the, but one of the things, and that's why I, I do mention this sort of post-truth phenomenon, the, the mythology in the community, are that even fair-minded people who want to understand it still are influenced by these, by these myths. 
uh, that uh, asylum seekers are on welfare and don't contribute to the community. Well, even the Business Council of Australia has said, <laughs> we want migrants, we want people mm. um, who've been through the process. Uh, they're absolutely vital, vital to Australia's gross domestic product. Mm. So uh, there's, there's, a, there's a wonderful level of support there, of course. The problem, I think, is that um, no, the coincidence of 9-11 and the Tampa episode and the political rhetoric around it meant that lying about boat people became politically effective. Um, calling them illegal, calling the exercise border protection. You get dishonest politicians like Peter Dutton, let him sue me for that. Um, tell it, lying, I mean, calling unauthorised what maritime arrivals, he calls them illegal maritime arrivals. He's repeatedly said how, how boat people are illegal. They don't. They don't commit any offence calling them illegal, calling the exercise of pushing them away border protection is simply dishonest. So what would Australians do? Most Australians, when they hear what we're doing to asylum seekers, are shocked. Um, but they're not allowed to know what we're doing to asylum seekers because, first of all, there's the lies, you know, coupled with the utterly deceptive suggestion that they really have to push the boats back because they're worried about people drowning. That's one of the really grand lies, because it sounds respectable. So what do they do to the ones who don't drown? Oh, we'll punish them. Mm. That's brilliant. I mean, that, that shows you where their sentiments really lie. We'll punish you if you don't drown, because we're worried that you might. That's odd. Mm. Um, what, do you do? what do you do to people who are caught in a burning building? You do not hit them on the head if they try to jump out of the window and escape to safety. Straight. And yet that's what we do with asylum seekers. Um, most Australians cannot, uh, cannot get to places like Nauru or Manus Island, cannot get access to the detainees. It's incredibly hard nowadays to get into the local detention centres, although they're mostly not boat people in the detention centres now. Um, and most people I speak to are really quite astonished when they learn what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Because you know, they recognise at some deep level, we're not a country that does that, surely. Like locking up Basic Basic for umpteen years without charge, without trial. There's a bloke on Christmas Island at the moment who was, he's stateless, he was born in West Sahara. He doesn't know exactly where because his parents are dead. Um, he got to Europe, he got caught up with some difficulties and fled Europe on his way to New Zealand. He was... Uh, the plane stopped in Australia. Uh, the immigration authorities here put him in detention. Hasn't got an asylum claim. He's been in detention on Christmas Island for eight years because mm -hmm. they can't remove him. They can't give him a visa or won't give him a visa of any sort. And he's a bloke in his mid-20s. Mm -hmm. Now, how do, most Australians would say, how can you do that to someone? How can you lock someone up? Who's well, I mean, this, this is, a, this is a, a key question, really. And, uh, wh why do our fair-minded, decent Australians, m most Australians, would never agree mm. to this behaviour if it was happening on their doorstep? Mm. How have we allowed this to happen? And, and one has to go back to the Holocaust. You have to say, how did this happen in Germany in the mm. 30s? Mm. Um, we, it, um, it, piece by piece this legislation to permit this regime and now we have of course the the super ministry of home affairs run by mr dutton piece by piece this legislation has been passed and we've been largely either oblivious to it or turned a blind eye to it um, i think it's something that's common to all societies that when it's not directly part of your own life you can you can ignore it especially if it's put in a context of fear that these people threaten our lives, they threaten Australian mm. borders, uh, they, 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 they jump the queue, they are, they're illegals, uh, that emotive language. Mm. Um, that fear has been prom prompted by our politicians and it's turned Australians into a people who say, we, we're, just, mm. we're just going to turn a blind eye, we won't look at it. That's the but worrying feature about what's going home. on now because mm. you know, in Germany, which was and is now a very civilised country, um, they were told for years, in the late 20s through to the mid-30s, late 30s, they were told for years that Jews were to be feared and hated. And that made it possible to mistreat them in ways that would be regarded now as, in 
Germany especially, would be regarded as utterly unthinkable. And well, we're I, doing I the same. We are right. behaving unthink in ways that are unthinkable. Well, I think we have to be alert to this. Mm. I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm loath to talk about the situation in Germany in the 30s mm. because it's overdone. People reach out to it too often, perhaps, and, and, uh, and diminish it in some respects. But I think it's dangerous in our society where we have um, no Bill of Rights, we're the only democracy and the only common law country in the world without one. We have an ex a government with executive powers that are unprecedented uh, that the Australian public knows almost nothing about. These laws are being introduced and passed regularly, including, you might be familiar with the new foreign interference laws and charity laws that are being considered in Parliament. It's complicated law. Yeah, people don't really understand it. It's put in highly emotive terms that we want to stop, as the Prime Minister said, we want to stop Chinese influence in Australia. I mean, a disgraceful thing for a leader to have said mm. in any event. Uh, <coughs> but, but putting that to one side, that's an example of the way in which our democracy is actually being chipped away um, by these laws that expand the government powers and that are outside the realm of judicial control. And, I, and Julian has, and I agree with you, Julian, that the courts have done a good job in some respects protecting human rights, and they have done in some cases, but in most they've been quite powerless because the language of the Migration Act is so crystal clear that judges, because of this deep fear in Australia of an activist judge, mm. will abide by the strict language of the Migration Act. And in, in one case that I'll mention very briefly, if I may, the M68 case, um, a, a Bangladeshi woman um, who, again, her claim to refugee status had not been assessed, but she was held on the roof for many, many months, was pregnant and was allowed to have a baby in Brisbane. She then sought an injunction to prevent being returned to Nauru with her uh, pro bono litigation lawyers. Um, and she challenged the Migration Act and said the Migration Act didn't allow the officials to deport her back to Nauru. And when the government officials and the lawyers looked at this, at the Migration Act, they said, well, actually, it doesn't allow deportation. So what do they do? Somebody in the public service, hopefully not a student of mine, goes and drafts another piece of legislation which fills the gap in the Migration Act retrospectively to cover the period of time that affected that Bangladeshi woman. Now, when that legislation, as amended, finally got to the High Court, the majority of the High Court said, well, initially and before the amendment, the government had no legislative power to um, <coughs> deport this woman back to Nauru. But because of the retrospective legislation, it cured the defect and we're now allowed to deport her. Only one judge on the High Court resisted that and that was um, Justice, Justice Gordon. Gordon. Yep. And she courageously, in my very respectful view, said, the conditions on Nauru are of a kind that constitute a penalty. And as you may know, only courts can impose penalties. The executive government cannot. This is the principle of the separation of judicial powers. Now, I know that this language is for lawyers, I, uh, but one of my concerns is that one of the <laughs> reasons we've been um, unwilling to speak up and step up about these conditions and treatment of asylum seekers is that Australians are not well educated about their constitution. When you talk about the uh, separation of judicial powers, the, the fact that only courts can impose penalties, the executive cannot, this is a crystal clear principle of our democratic system. And yet I think most Australians barely understand that it's there. And I, a, a survey was done not so uh, a few years ago um, in which the Electoral Commission asked Australians, do we have a constitution? And 48% of Australians said no. They then asked the next question, uh, do we have a Bill of Rights? And something like 68% of people said yes. Yes, and some of them supported that by saying, because we can always take the fifth. Which <laughs> That's quite right. Yeah. So we know more about our, our legal rights from American television programs than we do for our own education system. So I, I am deeply worried about this, for, mm. that this problem of turning a blind eye, of legislation being passed in Canberra, sophisticated stuff, complex, nobody gets across it, so it's polarised with, with, uh, with uh, slogans mm. to say we'll keep the foreigners out or we'll stop charities abusing the system or whatever slogan they want to use, and it all passes us by until one day it's on our doorstep.
and when a member of our family or we are affected by a breach of our human rights. And often that's discrimination in the employment area, delivery of goods and services. The major issue, of course, and one that we've finally resolved was marriage equality, the right of equality before the law. It's in the Victorian Charter. We don't have it at the federal level. Um, it's very complex, but it's very, it, I think it's mm. deeply troubling. Uh, I think the asylum seeker um, treatment is... Is, is a symptom of something much more dangerous and it shows up in the rejection of the Uluru Statement and the mm. failure to acknowledge uh, uh, the indigenous rights to land. Um, it, it's reflected in the fact that um, we now have more Aboriginal people in detention, uh, ten times more than we had at the time of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. We had, we've had something like 330 Aboriginal deaths in custody, exacerbated by laws in the Northern Territory, for example, um, the paperless arrest laws, where you can arrest people without any paperwork to save the police the paperwork. And uh, Indigenous Australians are now being held in unprecedented numbers. Um, Aboriginal children, 10 times more likely to be uh, taken into out-of-home care. Um, extraordinary rate, rates of domestic violence. Approximately a woman every week is killed by her partner or former partner. Um, juvenile detention facilities, juvenile, the juvenile um, crime rates, the failure to invest in our communities. So what I'm saying is it, the asylum seeker um, failure by Australia is actually mirrored in many, many other aspects mm. of Australian life, um, but it's one that the Australian public hasn't really understood. We see pockets of it, but we don't see the whole. Mm. So I think one of the problems is, in Australia, most people's human rights are not at risk. Um, but people at the margins, they're the ones whose human rights are at risk, but they're usually unpopular or totally powerless. That's and right. they, you know, so if their human rights are knocked out, no one cares. Um, that, that's, that's absolutely true, uh, Julian. Um, it, it is the, the, the vulnerable, <coughs> the homeless, the, the um, impoverished... Um, the mentally ill who are most vulnerable in addition obviously to asylum seekers being a slightly different category but I should say that at the Australian Human Rights Commission every year at the federal level and this is replicated in the Human Rights Commissions in every state and territory but at the federal level we would receive about 20,000 inquiries and complaints a year. They're ordinary Australians ringing the Commission or emailing the Commission with a, an essentially a human rights complaint but most of those are not any of the issues we've been talking about. Mm. They're almost always uh, employment discrimination or discrimination in the delivery of goods and services. So it's age discrimination. The majority of complaints are by people with disabilities. It's extraordinary. Um, they can't get access to theatres. They can't get jobs. They can't get sustainable uh, positions. They can't get proper housing. Um, these are issues that I think perhaps if we understood those issues a little bit better, mm. it might provide a platform for then understanding some of the other mm. issues that are more distant, yeah. remote, indigenous, homeless, violence and yeah. so on. And now we're, we're being prompted to move to question and answers in a moment, but before we do, um, one of the difficulties with all of this, of course, is that, a, I mean, the Human Rights Commission is terrific because people can go there, they don't need lawyers, lawyers are a nuisance. But if they want to try and redress their rights in other forums, they probably do need a lawyer. And most people can't afford lawyers. And the government is gradually defunding legal aid. And they threatened, last year was it, to reduce the funding of community legal centres. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, I did some calculations when they were about to reduce the funding of community legal centres. With the funding that the community legal centres received before any cuts, um, and given the number of people they saw, was working out at less than $300 per consultation. Now, try and get that from a lawyer. You know, I mean, it's, it's just dazzling. And yet, the same government that wants to hide from us the nasty things it's doing is making it harder and harder for people whose rights are trashed to get any sort of remedy at all. And that's, um, that's something right, we all is, uh... we should all be worried about it. You know, remember Martin Niemöller, when they came for the socialists, I said nothing because I'm not a socialist. When they came for the trade unionists, I said nothing because I'm not a trade unionist. When they came for the Jews, I said nothing because I'm not a Jew. And when they came for me, there was no one to speak for me. We all need to bear that in mind. It's very hard to do it, but well, you and I probably find it a bit easier. <laughs> 
to think of ourselves being hurled into the darkness, but um, all of us should bear that in mind, I think. Anyway, I think John is going to, yes, he's going to interrupt us. <laughs> and say that other thing about the Indigenous people. <laughs> You're very gracious here. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> so I'm sure there are lots of questions in the room. We have just under half an hour for you to ask them of these two nuisances who are going to stay with us for a bit longer. So, yes, just We're raise your hand. We're un-Australian. We're un-Australian. <laughs> Remember? Peter Dutton told yes, us lawyers that. lawyers are un-Australian. Yeah. 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 Um, just raise your hand and a microphone will come to you. So please wait until you have a microphone. Um, and I will gradually get around as many people as I can. Okay. Hi. Thanks for that. That was really great to listen to. Um, I was just wondering how you think that the lack of diversity in our parliament affects all these issues. We seem to have a very um, senior group leading us at the moment and lack of diversity in culture, language, gender, and if we sort of had more youth maybe generated in our leaders, how this might change issues regarding human rights as, you know, it's much more of a relevant issue. Well, can I say, from my experience, the people who are the most active and the most effective in this area have been people who are not only young but also female. Young women have been incredibly powerful, way beyond their numbers. Um, so bring it on. <laughs> yes. Oh, I, 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 it is interesting, actually. Young, young women really do get this. I, I think, of course, diversity is across the entire community. It's extraordinary how we are led uh, by um, older white men. <laughs> um, wonderful though some of them are. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think it, 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 we are uh, our, our, our corporate world, banking world, um, uh, and certainly governance does not reflect the society that we are. And uh, one of the things I've loved about my job is I've, I've been able to work across Australia, all over the country, you know, in rural areas, all over the, all the major cities, provincial towns and country communities. And, and that's when you realise just what an extraordinary country we are, of such fascinating diversity and languages and cultures, but we have not really learned to embrace it. And uh, if, you, if, you, if none of those arguments affect you, look at the economic ones. When women and um, people of different religions and cultures and races are on boards, the share price goes up within a couple of years. It's just astonishing. Um, there's much greater diversity, much greater um, uh, creativeness, to, um, uh, new ideas, uh, confidence, competence, uh, and good governance with diversity. And I think that must, we definitely need it at the, at the federal level. It's been a struggle, it, it, it's disgraceful where we are now. I think on the World Economic Forum's Global Index, um, uh, women now are 75th in the world for political engagement at, at senior levels. It's just extraordinary where we are, except we're number one in the world for education. Hmm. So something has gone very, very badly wrong in Australia over the last, particularly the last 20 years. So diversity, yes, covering a lot of aspects of our contemporary life. Yes, we have a microphone. Preferably, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Providentially, a letter came from Mr Dutton two days ago, and I thought it's, I must bring it tonight. It was written by me and um, Bishop Philip Huggins on behalf of Befriend a Child in Detention, one of the groups, one of the many groups that is trying to help the children on Nauru. And we had written to Mr Dutton back in February. It's taken quite a while for the response, but he does apologise. Um, for the length. Uh, we had written to inquire as to why the official uh, statistics that you can find on immigration department websites about the number of children on Nauru, the la latest that we could find was February, said that there were 30. And we knew that there were at least 150. There seemed such a discrepancy, we thought we should ask the minister. And he has responded. And there were just two lines I would like to read to you from his letter, which will bring you much comfort. Well, I have to put my glasses on. Oops. Thank you. First of all, in one of his paragraphs, he says, 
As a party to the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees, the Refugee Convention, in case we didn't know, and its 1967 protocol, Australia takes its international obligations seriously. Australia is committed to providing protection to refugees consistent with the obligations set out in the Refugee Convention and other relevant international treaties to which Australia is a party. Well, you may not have known that, but that's what he says. And then could, he comes could you come to the, sorry, could a little come later to the, the figure. So no, there's only the one more sentence, okay. I promise. From a peak of 1,992 children in held detention on the 31st of July 2013, the number of children in held detention was reduced to zero on the 1st of April 2016. It was reduced to zero. Because they weren't in detention because is, Nauru has a, a constitutional bill of rights. But we've still been mm. sending them gift. It's strange, isn't it? Well, mm. this, is the, the, this, is the, this is where I think, to put it very gently, this is deeply misleading of the Australian public. It, it's frankly a lie. Mm. Um, we, we, it, the secrecy surrounds all of this. It's very difficult to get accurate figures. But we, I believe that you're right at about 140 children on Nauru. But they make a distinction between those that are in held detention, that is within a, a designated detention centre, and those that might now be in the local community, uh, effectively detained on an island. In international law, that is detention. But that's not how... The, you see, this government... It's a bit like Alice in Wonderland, uh, the caterpillar, as was it. Uh, uh, the words mean what I want them to mean. And that's, that's really... It's, it's, uh, it's 1984 all over again. The truth is what is what the leader describes as the truth. It's, it's very worrying, and that letter really is a, an extremely good example of it, so thank mm. you very much. I, I want to add a little observation. For all of you who are inclined to write a letter to a politician, write to your local member of whichever major party and the opposite, that person's opposite number, but write a brief letter. A, a classic will be something like, um, dear so-and-so, I'm a voter in your electorate. Do you think both people are, quote unquote, illegal? If yes, what offence do they commit? Yours faithfully. <laughs> um, the shorter it is, the more difficult it is for them to escape answering it. That's a good bit of barrister's advice. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say that one of the things also that's so powerful is, um, is film. And some of you may be aware there's a human rights film festival just, just launching tonight, in fact, uh, with, um, with a... Um, with a marvellous film, I think, uh, 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 an apology or saying sorry means you won't do it again. Where I think it's the opening film, but there's another one, a marvellous one coming up called Borderland. Border politics. Border po politics, I'm sorry. Um, that uh, has been um, produced and is, it, it covers all of these issues, but in, in, in um, s uh, graphic, uh, cinematogra uh, cinematographic form, and it's very powerful, and uh, it, it, it explodes these myths, but of course it's global, it's not just Australia, but it's very interesting um, how, how isolated Australia is from the international standards of so many other countries on these questions, and that again is a matter of concern as for our democracy. I agree with that, and I should say I'm the unscripted sort of David Attenborough character in it, <laughs> and Gillian is one of the people I speak to in the course of the film, so. <laughs> Over there. Yeah, Sorry. if you could just wait for a microphone. Just got one here. Oh, okay. All right, I've been usurped. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, so there's a lot of legislation, like you said, coming through Canberra that is obviously quite questionable, and yet it's being passed. One particular uh, amount of amendments, I guess, came through the Foreign Fighters Bill, which is now legislation and looking at the ASIO powers. So my question to you is whether um, which human right is obviously the most impacted upon with that, and is there a constitutional breach? Also, does our state practice uh, breach international human rights laws? Are you asking with particular reference to the Foreign Fighters Bill yes. uh, Act? Yes, and yeah. the ASIO, the uh, detention powers the, and the meaning as well behind all the definitions and the powers, that, the extensive powers that they now have that they can do with the executive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, look, you've asked a, 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 an enormous number of <laughs> questions there, uh, and, and then they're important. They're very important um, because these just slip by. But uh, my own view is that, firstly, we are almost invariably in breach of our international obligations. 
And can I just take a moment to say, um, this is the year we're celebrating the anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Some of you in the room mm. might recall this remarkable man, Doc Evatt, who helped um, draft it and was president of the General Assembly when it was passed in, uh, without a single negative vote in 1948. Mm. The Universal Declaration has formed the basis for all of the human rights treaties uh, that Australia played such a strong role in negotiating, ratifying, but we haven't given effect to them in domestic law. That is why you get this huge uh, diversity. Our international obligations over there, which we are ignoring, and I think the simple answer, if there is one, to what you've said is, yes, we are in breach of our international obligations. The Foreign Fighters Bill breaches freedom of movement, um, all sorts of um, uh, principles of the rights in relation to citizens that are our, our citizens who might be fighting in that bill. Um, but, but it means that in the domestic law context, we do not have the protections in our domestic law that we should have. Mm. And that is why we have these, this, um, it's like ships passing in the nights, the international law that, that our forebears developed in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, right up to the International Criminal Court uh, in the 90s. And then it stopped, uh, as Julian has said, uh, with, with the children overboard. Um, uh, can I point out, though, that there are now submissions to the International Criminal Court to bring um, government officials, including Mr Dutton, uh, before the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity. Now, I don't know where that's going to go, but it gives you some idea or draws us into the international community. We cannot turn our backs on the community that we were once so strongly a part of. Um, we're now back in the Human Rights Council, and that's a good thing. I, I hope that will at least open our eyes a little. But it's a terrific question, it's a complicated one. Too. There's a footnote to that, by the way, um, since I'm the author of one of the um, communiques to the ICC. Um, when we signed up to be, belong to the International Criminal Court, a condition of it is that you have to introduce in your own domestic law uh, charges that are equivalent to the offences of the Statute of Rome over which the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction. We did that in October of 2002. So before October 2002, if you committed genocide, that wasn't an offence. Uh, after October 2002, it was. And so in that part of the Commonwealth's Criminal Code, there are all these offences that mirror the Statute of Rome. But a prosecution for breach of those provisions can only be brought with the approval of the Attorney General. And generally speaking, the Attorney General seems reluctant to prosecute members of his own party. Yes, highly unlikely. Thank you. There was someone in the middle there who's been waiting for a while. Hi, uh, Julian and Julian, thank you so much. Um, I, preliminary statement, I, I have in good faith been trying to make the best list that I can, but um, aside from writing a, a brief, sharp letter to our local member and, and his or her shadow, um, what can Joe or Jill, audience member, do to defend and extend human rights? What, what can we do tomorrow? <clears throat> That's a really good question. Well, uh, maybe, maybe advocating question. for... A, a charter of human rights at federal level because I think most Australians do have a sense of what is decent conduct and what's not and we are behaving indecently because we have laws that permit it. But if, if you had protection of human rights at that level by reference to general propositions like we see in the Universal Declaration, then those laws would be seen for what they are. A, real betrayal of our character as a nation, I think. Um, I think speaking you... up. Hmm. Each of you lives in your own environment as, as professionals, as teachers, public servants. Speak up um, about this. Uh, get your facts right. That's important because if you get it wrong, you, people can dismiss you terribly quickly. Get your facts right. And speak up and use whatever forum you've got. If it's your local gardening newsletter, get it in there. Um, Julian and I did something recently up at Wodonga for Rural Australians for Refugees. Wonderful women. I'm a patron of, um, of um, older women for refugees and um, rural Australians for refugees. And do things with the knitting nanas, grandmothers who support asylum seeker children. I think what we've been lulled into a passivity which is not the Australian mythology about ourselves. We like to see ourselves as being you know, out there and idiosyncratic and individual and, and anti-authoritarian. I think that's mythology. I think the reality is we've become very passive uh, 
And if it doesn't affect us, we don't deal with it. And I'm really saying now to everybody who asked that very important question, speak up. S say what you can in the sphere that you can. And, and, uh, and I think uh, now, speak up for a Charter of Rights. Say it's time that we had some legislative protection <coughs> against abuse of government power in Canberra uh, that's being favoured, of course, by both major parties. This is not a party political point. It's a, it's a, it's a point that's happening across, across the spectrum. No, I agree with that, but I'll just add one thing. Not everyone is able to speak up about a Bill of Rights or about the treatment of asylum seekers, for example. But there are lots and lots of breaches of human rights that exist in our community. See if you can help the people who are suffering from those abuses of human rights. You know, do something. Give, give expression to the decency which I think informs most Australians. Um, and it doesn't matter who you're helping. Helping one person at a time makes a big difference. Mm, I, I agree with that. There's a great story about, um, and I'm sure this has probably got an origin in most countries, of a, a big beach where every now and then, depending on the state of the tide and the, and the wind, uh, at high tide, lots of starfish get washed up onto the beach. And as the tide recedes, they're left there. And if they stay in the sun for too long, they die. A little girl who lives in a town nearby is very distressed by this, goes down to the beach. And a grown-up says to her very sensibly, you can't save them all. So her response is to bend down, pick one up, throw it into the ocean and said, well, I've, fixed, I've saved that one. We can, if we all do that, if we all try and save one person, we're making an enormous difference to human rights in this country. Mm. Thank you. At the back there. Thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. Um, my question is, as climate change gets worse, and as we will see that throughout our lifetime, um, what, do you think, uh, what do you think the impact will be both on politics and on human rights? So, uh, could you repeat that last part? What do you... Uh, sure. Um, what do you think the impact of climate change will be on politics and human rights? Mm -hmm. mm. Small Not good. Well, it's already, <laughs> <laughs> it's already had a huge impact on politics, as we know. Um, I think we have to be very conscious of, of the fact that many human beings, our lives will be directly affected by climate change and are being affected by climate change. And, and I don't, I, I tend to see them as integrated ideas that, that human beings have a right to a healthy environment. But equally, we should work empathetically with the environment. We're intertwined. We, we depend on the environment. The, dependent, uh, the environment has to uh, manage with us. Um, I think it, we, we just need to understand that there's, a, there's an opposite and equal action for every one of our actions. And uh, we must. Uh, in the global sense, understand that as sea rises um, increase, as the ocean becomes acidic, as our forests are, are dying and species are becoming extinct, people are moving across um, vulnerable areas in the Mekong Delta and certainly in the smaller Pacific Islands. Uh, disease will spread in different ways across the African continent. Um, I think we've got to speak up for these issues. They're fundamentally important and they're important to human rights, uh, but humans have a responsibility to the environment and I think they're intertwined. There's another hand up at the back there. Just there. Uh, the talk of climate change just brought to mind um, the anti-scientific, the attack on science, the attack on experts. So for example, you are experts in law. Um, where that whole uh, belief in education and experience and being an expert in the field is being undermined. It almost chips away the base of our whole society. I mean, I guess you could also include parliament, you know, lack of faith in parliament and government institutions. How do we tackle that sort of massive problem? Um, on climate change, you're right, there has been an, an attack on climate change or climate scientists. Um, there's a good response to it. And that is, if, if you meet a climate change denier, you say to them, OK, what percentage of climate scientists believe it's real and anthropogenic and dangerous and so on? And if they know their facts, they'll tell you it's in the high 90%. And they would say, 
that scientific truth isn't proved by majority vote, and that's true. So you say, OK, well, let's, let's give it 80% odds against the climate scientists. Let's say 80% says they're wrong, but 20% says that, you know, it could be really bad and we could do something to stop it. 20% chance of an avoidable catastrophic result is worse odds than Russian roulette. So tell them to go and play Russian roulette with their grandchildren. <laughs> they will not have an answer to that, by the way. Well, I think, yes, that, that's true. I, I, one of my disappointments is that education hasn't been this, the key. Uh, when mm. I, I was at the law school here up the road at the University of Melbourne in, in the early 60s, and privileged to have a completely free education, I might add, um, on a Commonwealth scholarship, which were, a lot of people got them in those days, I wasn't particularly special. But I remember thinking then that this was the age to be a woman. Um, we were, we had an opportunity for education on an equal basis. The doors were opening. With education, women could do anything. Um, and that's why I mentioned that statistic earlier tonight, that we're number one in the world for the World Economic Forum for Women in Education. Uh, and yet we're so far down, we're ranked all over 46th in the world um, for, for, for gender equality. Um, it, the lesson I seem to be having to face is that education is not always the answer. There are power structures, there's systems, there's regimes, uh, there's culture that, 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 that pushes against uh, science, expert evidence, rationality and ordered thinking. And, and I think that is a great challenge for today uh, in this environment where we have, a, according to the researchers, a growing tolerance for subjective ideological <coughs> positions. And it's very, very worrying indeed. And as, as Julian has pointed out, the evidence for human-induced climate change is pretty overwhelming. Uh, why are we not accepting that and acting in accordance with it? But there's, so we've got to look to other reasons, which is really behind your question. I think we've got to, we need leadership, we need cultural change, systemic changes. We have to completely rethink the way in which we go about our lives. But we must come back to the 60s world that I grew up in, where we respected facts, and we respected evidence, and we respected experts. And, and that's been a completely unpredictable and unexpected a consequence of the last few decades, particularly the last 20 years. So there's another letter you could write to your local parliamentarian in the post-Trump world. Do you believe truth matters? Yours faithfully. <laughs> well, there's a book by a marvellous woman, um, a dean of, the, um, dean of the School of Management at uh, Harvard, and she has written a book called Do Facts Matter? Ah, and she yeah. did the survey for the year before Trump was elected. Um, and uh, she made the definitive finding that facts do not matter once you have a subjective view and you've made up your, your subjective mind consistent with your ideology, the facts are irrelevant. Now, with that as a fact, <laughs> what are we going to do about it? Uh, I, I, all I can think of is to push back with more facts and more education and try to get the depth of the problem understood. Now, we're down to our last two questions in view of the time. So one there and then one at the back, maybe three. If they're quick. We've, we've talked a lot about truth today and truth tellers. My question is about Julian Assange. He's an Australian, if we remember, and he has been on indefinite detention as well for a long, long time. Uh, do you have anything to say about that? I've visited him in the Ecuadorian embassy and it's it's a very lovely place, but it was terrible that he's been there so long. The problem is, in Britain, he is very unpopular because he jumped bail by going into the Ecuadorian embassy. And they will, they will lock him up if he steps out the front door. Now, our government, in my opinion, our government should be taking active steps on his behalf to arrange that he can be removed from the Ecuadorian embassy and be brought safely to Australia. But as far as I'm aware, our government is doing nothing of the sort. So yes, we need to be worried about him. He's, he's a person who's, I, I wouldn't say it's indefinite detention because he went there by choice and he stays there by choice because the alternative is so dangerous for him. 
Yes, I, I mean, the, the, the unpopularity is, is, a, is a very negative mm. fe fe factor for him in Britain. Um, I mean, with the benefit of hindsight, if he'd, if he'd gone to Sweden and faced the charges, um, he probably, well, there's a chance he would have had proper justice, at least proper the justice. Prob the problem with but that, he the problem with that was he wasn't going to Sweden mm. because Sweden has a witness exchange arrangement with America. That's right. This was when uh, Bradley Manning, as he was then, was on trial. He'd been held in terrible conditions for about a year before being brought to trial. And the government of America wanted to get Assange over there so they could try That's him right. alongside Well, that Manning. was the problem. If he'd gone to Sweden, he would have, been, uh, he would have yeah. been extradited to the United States and he would have been in an orange jumpsuit and chains uh, in minutes. And so I can I'm fully understand why he did it as a strategy. Um, but I, I do agree that the Australian government, in this case and in others, has been disgraceful in our failure to represent an Australian citizen and to argue the case for him. Um, he has been a truth teller, um, but he is unpopular in America, in the United States and parts of, parts of Scandinavia as well. So he's, he's got a hard battle to fight, but I think that uh, we, should, we should try to keep our mind on what it was he did and perhaps ac accept that by getting the truth and the facts out, uh, there was some justification for his behaviour. He did exactly what other organs of the press did. And what he was saying, what he was revealing, wouldn't have been known to anyone if it hadn't been repeated by uh, the, the, the Murdoch the, the press, the, the and, press and others, and they're not being hounded. We are almost out of time, so time for one more question, but it's possible that Julian and Julian might be able to have a quick discussion with people afterwards. But last question, please. Right at the back there, yeah. What is your response to technology, specifically the internet, becoming a platform for human rights abuses such as racism? Mm. Well, it's, an, it's a new technology, relatively new technology. It's, it's been remarkable in terms of access to information and to the exercise of freedom of speech. Uh, this is not a subject that we've touched on this evening, but it's obviously one that I spend a great deal of my time on, particularly on 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act. Um, yes, the, the, uh, the internet and social media is a vehicle for profound racism and uh, it makes the point that freedom of speech is a right but that right can be abused and it is abused. Um, and let me perhaps give you a very quick example if I may. Um, a few years ago we at the Human Rights Commission had um, a racism it stops with me um, uh, social program that the AFL was going to launch kindly for us at a, an indigenous game or an indigenous week game, uh, the Swans Collingwood match. I'm a Collingwood supporter, not doing very well at the moment, but I did watch the match. And who was playing but um, Adam Goods, and he was um, abused racially by a young girl. Unfortunate, sad circumstances, but that's another story. But the key point was that we had... Um, the video and the program open in a chat room at the Human Rights Commission uh, for discussion about the Racism It Stops With Me program. That, of course, exploded uh, with the Adam Goods incident and, of course, the Eddie Maguire um, casual racism the following Monday morning uh, in an appalling... It made the whole situation far worse. The point of my story is that this open chat room for discussion about racism by Monday morning had turned into one of the most vicious anti-Semitic attacks. It had nothing whatever to do with Adam Goods or indigeneity. It, it, it started there and it moved, by, within 24 hours it had moved into anti-Semitism. And I closed the site down because it was out of control. I was then accused of, by the Murdoch press, of having uh, breached the rights to freedom of speech. <laughs> so this is, we're in a bad place on this, on the, on this discussion at the moment. Um, my view, and it's not one that everybody shares, and I accept that it's a balance and reasonable minds can differ about it, but my own view is that we have every right to stop people abusing others in the public arena because of their race or national ethnic origin. And despite two prime ministers and one attorney doing everything they could for three or four years to amend or, or change that law, it is now intact and it continues to underpin our multicultural society. So thank you for your question. I think it's an important one.
I want to deal with one very limited slice of the question, and that is the phenomenon of trolls on the internet, on Twitter specifically. Um, I'm not convinced, I mean, and I get my fair share of abuse from trolls, but I'm not convinced that it's much more painful than when bad-mouthing and gossip happened in the local club, or whatever it was, in the local community. Uh, it's just, it just reaches more people. Um, whether that matters to you as an individual is a, an open question, but I think the benefits we get from the internet probably outweigh the disadvantages. So look, sadly, we're slightly over time now, but um, could I ask you to thank most warmly our two discussants this evening, who I think have been absolutely brilliant. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.